You uh, may know that Israel fought many wars and lost millions in all those wars, but the story of Esther tells us, the Bible tells us that they didn't lose one person. You realize that? Not one. And yet it was 2,500 years ago, and still the groggers and the hatred towards Haman. You might wonder why, 2,500 years, you didn't lose one person. Jewish people hold the grudge, that's the bottom line. <laughs> We got lights, lights, God said let there be lights. Um, okay, so you might be here for the first time or this might be your first year here. Um, you know, the book of Esther is a, a big part of our Bible. It's, it's a big part. And so you hear the groggers when, and so I might say Haman's name and... Just so you know, they're not booing me. They're not allowed to do that. (laughs) So next week, keep the grogger at home. But I don't think we should use the groggers just for Purim. Like, let's say you're married. (laughs) And your wife is somewhat of a... A nag. I needed a... On the other side, let's see your husband's a little overbearing and domineering. Not saying that any of you are. (laughs) Honey, can you get me the... (laughs) Try it. It works in our house really well. Okay, let me give you a little intro, even though you saw the play and probably read the book many times. You know, another thing is that it's so different. You know, I called a bunch of my pastor friends. You know, I have pastor friends, real good pastor friends. In May, I'll be going to... A big church in Tennessee, he was the president of the Southern Baptist Convention. We're best friends. I have another friend on the executive committee of the Southern Baptist. We're best friends. Not friendly. We talk all the time. But I asked them, have you ever preached on the book of Esther? And they said, no. And I'm amazed. I'm just amazed. Probably many of you have gone to church. Have you ever heard a preaching on the book of Esther? It's, it's so encouraging. You know what I mean? I told them, I said, you need to do it especially in the time we live in. Purim is one of the happiest holy days on the Jewish calendar. Haman. Good thing I'm pretty secure and confident in my walk with the Lord. (laughs) Was an ancient Persian forerunner of Hitler plotted to kill all the Jews. The Lord foiled his plan and avenge the Jews from this would-be mass murderer and all his supporters. Aside from the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, Esther is the Bible's best-known book among modern Jews. Purim relates how Esther is drafted into King Ashaviris' beauty contest, all the while at her cousin Mordecai's directive, keeping her religious origins a secret. A short time later, after Esther has won the contest and married the king, Mordecai infuriated Ashaviris' most powerful advisor, Haman, by refusing to bow down before him. Haman considers it beneath his dignity to wreak vengeance upon Mordecai alone. Instead, Haman concocts a plan to wipe out all the Jews, using arguments that have remained part of the arsenal of anti-Semites ever since. Haman speaks to Ashaviris that the Jews were dangerous. This has been going on from the beginning of time. The Jews are dangerous. King Ashaviris gives in to Haman's plans, both of them unaware that the beloved queen is Jewish. When news of Haman's plot surfaces, Mordecai urges Esther to intervene with the king. Her first instinct is to refuse. To go to the king without being summoned, she informs her cousin is a capital crime. Mordecai persists, and Esther concedes... Even more than Pharaoh, Haman becomes for Jews the symbol of the Jew hater, the would-be Hitler of his day. That is why the retaliation carried out against him is so satisfying. Esther goes to Ashavira, succeeds in turning him against his evil advisor. Haman is hanged from the very gallows he set up for Mordecai and the Jews are saved. The reason why the Megillah or the scroll of Esther is read when I was Orthodox, we read it the night before and we read it in the synagogue, is because... 
The whole idea of Judaism, not only to glorify God, is to teach the children. It's vador, door vador, from generation to generation. The whole idea is that our children should have a better walk and a better relationship with God than we do. And to pass on generation to generation more of an understanding of God that they would pass on to their next generation. That's what it's all about. That's why in the Bible, when I first came here and I, I saw the way a lot of churches run, you know, no offense, but that the people depend on their pastor. The pastor cannot train the children. It's not possible. Not even he's the greatest pastor in the world. People say, well, my pastor. No, your pastor is your father. The Bible says, teach your children when they rise up. That means when they awaken, when they lie down before. Who's with them before they go to sleep? I'm not. You are. I'm with mine. I'm, my calling is to be a rabbi here, but my function is to be a teacher in my house. That's my flock. When they walk on the road, when they sit in the house, if you're always busy with business and always on your computer or your phone, who's going to teach them? Do you, do you wonder why the statistics from Barner? This is Barner is the greatest statistician we have in Christianity. Pew Research, Tom Rayner of Lifeway, 80% of children when they leave the youth group and go to college walk away from God and never return. That's a legit statistic. Because you're depending on a youth pastor for an hour after he plays a game for half an hour? To train your children the way they should go when it's not his job? He's the vitamin. He's not the primary nutrition. And so we change the whole thing here. We change the game and people say, it's working in our house. It's working in our house. How did you come up with this, Rabbi? And I said, I didn't. Deuteronomy did. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. We don't have to figure out a new way. We don't need a new book on how to train our children. We have an old book that does a great job. Now, next week, I'm going to talk about Esther 2, and um, I'm going to talk more prophetically, the prophetic aspect of who the king is, who Esther is, who Mordecai is, and who Haman is. We are absolutely, positively living in the last days. Now, a lot of people say nobody knows when the last days are supposed to be. That's absolutely not true. Yeshua said, you know when the sky is red what the weather is going to be. When the sky is red in the morning, you know what the weather is going to be. You could see the weather signs, but you don't know the signs of the time. He chastised the people. And he said, you would not know the day or the hour, but you would know the season. Just like when the leaves bring forth on the olive tree, you know it's spring. You should know the season. And when they asked him, what are the signs of the end of the age? He gave them 97 verses, and he didn't speak much. The Gospels are small, and three are synoptic, seen through the same eyes. So we should know the season. I'm here to tell you, thus saith the Lord, tis the season. Amen. And it's not the season just because there's a war in Ukraine. There's been wars when I was over in, in, in uh, Africa. There was tribal wars. There's still tribal wars with the Luau and the Kukui in Kenya. There'll always be wars. This is nothing new. It's not about wars or earthquakes or tremors, we've always had those. When the state of Israel came back into being, into fruition in 1948, and when she was back in the hands of the Jewish people, Jerusalem, in 67, a light switch went off in heaven. Luke 21, 24 went off. And as you see these Jewish people returning, there are no Jews anywhere anymore, basically, except in America. And she's the last one. And why are the Jews staying in America? Because they have the life here. Their kids go to Ivy League schools. They, they belong to country clubs. They're making seven figures. Why do they want to go to Israel? People think Israel's affluent. Israel spends all their money on military. One third of the people live be below the poverty line. I've been there 20 times. I was just on the phone with my friend in Israel this morning. I have a lot of friends in Israel. I do a lot of work in Israel. It's poverty stricken. Jews don't want to go there. For what? But the Bible says they have to. And that means they're going to, whether they like it or not. And how are they going to get there? Hit them in the pocketbook. You haven't seen nothing. You think the gas prices are bad? You haven't seen nothing. God's going to hit us in the pocketbook until we get moving. Because he says we're going to return to the land, and then we're going to return to him. 
And there will not be any great revival in Europe. And there will not be any great revival in America. Will people still be getting saved? Yes, but the times of the Gentiles have come to the close, basically. The next great revival will be in Israel, according to Joel 2. And it's coming very soon. And you need to get ready for the return of the Messiah. Now, what I will tell you about Esther is you can glean a lot of practicality from this story. Some of you can come up here and preach and give me a few points, and I'm sure I'd learn something from it. Um, I'm going to give you some practical lessons because I think practicality is very important how we apply the Scriptures. First, you need to learn the Scriptures and interpret them, but then you need to apply them. Let's take a look at the first practical lesson we have whatever god says is major league if god says it it's major okay we don't get to decide well this is really important i'll highlight this it might be important to you but it might everything god says is important let me give an example using the book of esther esther 2 5 it says there was in shushan now shushan is hebrew and in Persian language, by the way, Iran was called Persia for thousands of years. Do you know when it became Iran or Iran? 1935, very recent, very recent. In fact, I asked you this morning, do we have people from out of town? And we have people from Chicago, we have Illinois, we have Michigan, we have Texas, we have Florida. You guys watch online and you come to visit, right? Alabama. But we have somebody from Iran. Hello, where are you from Iran. That's my new friend from Iran. I had Shabbat dinner with her, and she's a beautiful young lady, just a princess of God. And we had a wonderful time last night. Um, her story, you get to meet her, say hello to her. You know, she was in a very Muslim country, and she became a believer. And uh, she had a run, really escaped for her life almost basically. And now she's here, and hopefully she'll be staying in the United States with us. We'll see. Um, but she knows that the name is called Shush. This place is a real place, Shush, in, in, in Farsi. And it is 400 miles southwest of the capital, Tehran, where she is from. Um, so it says there was in Shushan, the capital, a man who was a Jew, whose name was Mordecai, the son of Yair. By the way, Mordecai means little man. It's translated from the Hebrew to little man. So if you think you're a little person, that's very true. Every single person in here, including yours truly, is very little. But we work for a ginormous God, no? Amen. The son of Yair, the son of Shemai, the son of Kish, of Benyamini, meaning from the tribe of Benjamin. We know our tribes because if you're Orthodox, when I was young, growing up, when I got called up to the Torah, I had to be called up by my name, son of, they always said son of. So they would go, Yamod, get some Moshe, Ben, Mayavelvo. They'd call my father. You know why? You're always called by who, who you belong to because you could bring honor to their name or dishonor to their name. We were always taught it's very important how you represent your family. Isn't that neat? Don't you wish more people were taught that? <laughs> so we got called up Ha Levi, Levite, or the tribe of Levi. We know our tribes because it's passed down through the generations. We have to know. Our fathers have to tell us. Grandfather told my father. Great-grandfather told my grandfather. That's the way it is. So he was a Benjaminite. Why is this important? You would read this. The typical believer would read this and go, who cares? Who cares the lineage? The lineage is, you have a genealogy in Matthew that undeniably explains where Yeshua came from. This is really important. You know what I'm saying? We didn't have these fakakta, what are they, these crazy services you send in your spit and all of a sudden you find out, you know, you will, you know, one millionth Jewish or something like this. This is, the Bible declares these kinds of things. It's very important. It's a history book. And it's beautiful how you can cross-reference it with dates and other history books. Mordecai's ancestor, it says here, is Kish, right? Why is that so significant? Some of you who have studied the book know because that makes Mordecai a descendant of King Saul. Yes? Now, I'll tell you why that's so important, but let me show you why we know that. We go back 
600 years, because this is 483 BC, we go back to 1040, the time that Saul was king in Israel, and we go to 1 Samuel 9, 1 through 2. If you're here and you haven't been here before, you might think, wow, I feel like I'm in class. You are. We have enough people rah, rah, sis, boom, barring. Yeshua said he'd look at the people of Israel and say, look, sheep without a shepherd. And then there was a comma in all the Gospels, and he sat down and taught. We need teachers out there, man. I'm not saying I'm one of them. I'm just saying we need teachers. There was a man from Benjamin, Benjamin named Kish. He had a son named Shaul, Saul, who was young and good-looking. Among the people of Israel, there was no one better-looking than he. He stood head and shoulders taller than anyone else in Israel. What does that tell you? Look out for the tall, good-looking ones, girls. Look out. <laughs> but besides that, Kish was a Benjamin knight whose son was Saul, okay? That's really crucial. You'll see in a minute. Esther 3.1. Sometime later, King Ashaviris began to single out Haman, the son of Hamdata the Agagai, crucial for advancement. Eventually, he gave him precedence over all his fellow officers. So Haman is an Agagite, okay? An Agagite, which means he's a descendant from the kings of the Amalekites, and what do we know about the Amalekites? Deuteronomy 25. It all connects 17 through 19. It's crazy when a guy gets up here and gives you one verse and talks for 40 minutes on that verse. With no context, no cross-reference, I want to see it throughout. It says, God says, remember what Amalek, the Amalek Amalekites, did to you on the road as you were coming out of Egypt. That's Exodus 17. Verses 8 through 16. How he met you by the road. He attacked those in the rear. It's a bully. Who was in the rear? The disabled. The old people. The little stragglers. The kids. A bully. Like Satan. No? Those who were exhausted and straggling behind when you were tired and weary. He did not fear God. Therefore, when Adonai your God has given you rest from all your surrounding enemies and the land Adonai your God is giving you, Canaan, which would become Israel, as your inheritance to possess, as your inheritance, people get into the politics of Israel. Don't get into the politics of Israel. Don't be politically correct. Look to be biblically correct. Okay? God gave the land. And if you want to know why, read in Leviticus what the Canaanites were doing. Disgusting, disgusting things. And God warned them and warned them, and they didn't repent, and they expired. He's giving it to you as your inheritance to possess. You ought to blot out all memory of Amalek from under heaven. Don't forget. Don't forget. What do we do as human beings? We forget what we should remember. And we remember what we should forget. So the Lord declared perpetual war on them because they ambushed the Hebrew stragglers on their way out of Egypt to Israel. Israel was not to forget, but I'm going to show you that apparently they did. 1 Samuel 15, 1 through 3, it says, Shmuel, Samuel, the prophet Samuel, said to Shaul, Saul, Adonai, the Lord sent me to anoint you king over his people, over Israel. Now listen to what Adonai has to say. Here is what Adonai Tzvaot, the Lord of heaven's host, says. I remember what Amalek did to Israel. God doesn't forget, except your sins, if you know Yeshua. How they fought against Israel when they were coming up from Egypt. Now go and attack Amalek and completely destroy everything they have. Don't spare them. Don't try to figure it out. Don't figure out God. You'll never figure out God. If you think you know God, it shows how little you know. No one knows God. Isaiah says, who knows the mind of the Lord? Whom give him counsel? Who repeated that? The great Paul, the apostle Paul to the Gentiles. You don't know. All you're told to do is shema, listen and obey. That's our job, to listen and obey, nothing more. Don't analyze it. You know what happens when you overanalyze things? You get the analysis of paralysis. You do nothing. You're stymied, stagnated. Just go with it. Well, what if I didn't hear right? You know what? God has a way of 
changing some things, right? Just think of yourself like a chessboard. You're a chess piece. Let the hand of God come and just move you around. What's better than having the hand of God on your head? Don't spare them, but kill men and women, children and babies, cows and sheep, camels and donkeys. To stop the spread of their abominable practices. They were awful what they did. Read in Leviticus. I don't want to get into it because there's still some young kids here. Unbelievable evil. Evil to the nth degree. God told Saul, destroy the Amicalites. These were the descendants of Esau. 1 Samuel 15, 7 through 9. Then Saul attacked Amalek. Good. Starting at Havilah and continuing towards Shur, the whole area, to the very border of Egypt. He took Agag. Remember who was an Agagite? Who was the Agagite? Haman. Haman. How did that happen? He took Agag, the king of Amalek, alive. Why? Because Saul was a man of pride. He took, he took the king and he paraded him. They would put a collar around him and parade him like an animal. He said, look at my prize. That was his trophy. Putting all of them to the sword except, however, Saul and the people spared Agag along with the best of the sheep and cattle and even the second best, also the lambs and everything that was good. That was money in that day. Nobody throws away money, right? They weren't inclined to destroy these things. They're worth so much. Why are we going to destroy them? Because God said so. But everything that was worthless, so if it was worthless a week, get rid of it. If it's good, put it into my treasury. No matter what Saul was given to do, he always fell short of complete obedience. Saul put everything to the sword except for the king and a few animals. When I first read this as a young boy in Hebrew school, I thought, golly, what's God so mad about? It's so minor. He took out all of Amalek except the king and a few animals. Big deal, right? But it was Agag's offspring. The king obviously took a wife and had children, and those children had children. And 600 years later, one of those children in that lineage was Haman. And Haman tried to annihilate the Jewish people. Why is that important? Because if you annihilate the Jewish people, you thwart God's plan of salvation. I know this is hard. I know it's hard. Just as hard as it is for Jews to see Jesus. You say, how do they miss Jesus? I'm like, how do you miss the fact he's Jewish? No Jews, no Jesus. Matthew 1.1, there would be no line. There'd be no Jewish people. If there was no Jewish people, the wise men would come, where's the king of the Jews? They'd be like, the king of the who's? It's an ancient people, their history. That, my friends, is major league. Look at the rest of the story, 1 Samuel 15, 13 through 21. I'll go through it pretty quick. Samuel went to Saul. Saul said to him, may Adonai bless you. You know how people always do that when they're doing the wrong thing. What do they say? You look great. <laughs> right? You're such a great teacher. They flatter you because they want something. I have done what Adonai ordered. That's not true. Is it? 90% obedience is not obedience, guys. Just telling you. But Samuel answered, quote, if so, why do I hear sheep bleeding and cows mooing? Saul said, they brought, they. Does that not sound Adamic? The woman you gave me. They brought them from the Amalekites because the people spared the best of the sheep. Listen, because we were just going to sacrifice them to you. Because I didn't want to spend money on my own sacrifices, so why not give you free sacrifices? I can't stand when people give their junk to poor people. But we completely destroyed the rest. We did it. Then Samuel said, stop. 
stop already. Enough with you. Enough. You, ever, you ever have somebody in your family or somebody you know, or so, they just ex- excuse after excuse, you're like, enough already. Stop with your apologies. 70 times 7, you're up to 491, we're done. I'm going to tell you what Adonai said to me last night. Speak like he's going to hear something good. Let's go to the next slide. Samuel then said, you may be small in your own sight, but you are the head of the tribes of Israel. The Lord anointed you king over Israel. Now Adonai sent you on a mission and told you, go and completely destroy Amalek, those sinners. Keep making war on them until they have been exterminated. Why did you seize the spoil instead of paying attention to what Adonai said? From Adonai's viewpoint, you have done an evil thing. Let's finish the next couple of verses. Saul said to Samuel, I did too pay attention to what Adonai said. It's like your kid having all the chocolate all over his face. I I didn't eat that cake. (laughs) I carried out the mission on which Adonai sent me. I brought back Agag, the king of Amalek, and I completely destroyed Amalek. But the people took some of the spoil, the best of the sheep and the cattle set aside for destruction, to sacrifice to Adonai, your God, in Gilgal. Saul was never short of excuses. He was constantly redefining the Lord's commands, doing what seemed best to him rather than what God said was best. I'm here to tell you guys, and you know this better than I do, Father knows best. Last verse, which is a classic in the Word of God, 1 Samuel 15, 22. Samuel said, does Adonai take as much pleasure in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying what Adonai says, surely obeying is better than sacrifice and heeding orders than the fat of rams. This is a classic, not just in the story in Samuel. This is a classic in the Bible. You know what this says? Obedience first, obedience last, obedience always. That's what you need to do. Forget about who the 144,000 witnesses is, and start to obey God and witness to the glory of God. This is a watchword for those of us who would want to serve the Lord and please the Lord. Sacrifice without an obedient disposition is off in God's economy. If God tells us to do something, no matter how small it may look, no matter how small, if God commands it, it's major league. I'm here to tell you, we need to be careful in these last days because even good people are great at making bad decisions. Number two, God is sovereign. He is omnisciently, meaning he knows everything, directing the universe. People always tell me, you know what God's up to? I'm like, I cut them off at that point. I cut them off at that point. This is what God's doing. Really? Really? So he stopped saving the world? He stopped saving souls? He stopped calling people in the kingdom? Is that that what's happening? God's the boss. God is sovereign is a fancy way of saying God is the boss. And there is no underboss. Look at Esther 3, 1 through 4. Sometime later, King Ashaviris began to single out Haman, the son of Hamdata, the Agagai, for advancement. Eventually, he gained president over all his fellow officers. Number two. He's number two guy in the whole kingdom. How big was the kingdom? It went from India to where? Ethiopia. 127 provinces. The Persian kingdom was huge. They buried Babylon. Eventually, he gained presence over all his fellow officers. All the king's servants at the king's gate would kneel, you saw, and bow down before Haman because the king had so ordered. But Mordecai would neither kneel nor bow down to him. The king's servants at the king's gates asked Mordecai, why don't you obey the king's orders? Haman sent him. Why, we don't understand. Why, we heard you're not bow- Why? 
But after they had confronted him time after time, without his paying attention to them, they told Haman in order to find out whether Mordecai's explanation that he was a Jew would suffice. Would suffice. When it says, by the way, sometime later, from the end of Esther 2 to Esther 3 was five years. So be careful how you read your Bible. Don't think it was five minutes. It was normal practice according to Persian court etiquette to bow to their superiors. That was what they did. It was a way of worshiping them. But Mordecai is basically saying, I'm a Jew. No can do. I can't, I can't do it. You know, it, he didn't say, I will not do it. See, there's a big difference between your will and your behavior. He didn't say, I will not. He says, I cannot. You see the difference? In Acts 5, when they told them to stop, they said, not we will not. We, can, we can't. You asked me to stop, I can't. You have to kill me to make me stop talking about the greatness of God. It's not a matter of my will. You're bought with a price. You're God's property. You're owned. Stuff comes out of you that you don't even realize. You can't even control it, man. You're possessed by the Holy Spirit. Look at Exodus 21 through 3. You're familiar. Then God said all these words, I'm not know your God who brought you up out of the land of Egypt, out of the abode of slavery. You ought to have no other gods before me. This is the first of the ten. The Decalogue. The foundation of all the laws of God, of who He is, His character. This is a prohibition against worshiping many gods, which is known as polytheism, poly, many, theist, God. And against the worship of any other God except Adonai Elohim, the Lord our God. And this was repeated, no, by Yeshua, when the devil tempted him, tempted him for 40 days and 40 nights, all we have is record of three. And he says, bow down before me and I'll give you, I own the world. I'm the God of this world. Isn't the Bible called Satan the God of this world? And he said, no, it says you shall not bow down. He's quoting it. Esther 3, 5, 6. Haman was furious when he saw that Mordecai was not kneeling and bowing down to him. However, on learning what people Mordecai belonged to, it seemed to him a waste to lay hands on Mordecai alone. That's what anger does. You ever see somebody who's just out of control angry? They're a whirlwind, man. Just a whirlwind. Rather, he decided to destroy all of Mordecai's people, the Jews, throughout the whole of Ashaviris' kingdom. So, he's not under his own influence. Haman and people like him are under the influence of the Antichrist. That is the spirit that they operate in. I tell you all the time, your enemy does not have a social security number. Stop making your mother-in-law or your ex-partner or your ex-wife or your kid your enemy. Satan doesn't have a social security number. He works through people, but he's the enemy. And he's working through Haman right here. And he declares, kill all the Jews, which is Satan's battle cry. It's not Haman's. It's Satan's battle cry. Why do you think that that antichrist spirit got into Pharaoh and kill all the children two and under? Same thing, guys. No Jews, no Jesus. And then when he was born, didn't that spirit get into Herod? The Messiah is born. The wise men came. They studied under Daniel when he was in Babylon. They came. It was passed down generationally. We know the king. We saw his chocheb. We saw the messianic star. He's born, but he can't grow up. Satan doesn't want him to grow up, so he's born. Who cares? If he grows up, he dies for the sins of the world. And if he dies and resurrects, uh-oh, now we have a blessed hope. If he ascends, uh-oh, I can't stop him from coming back. All he's trying to do now is prevent him from coming back, which is in stone. Colossians 2 says when he rose up, he made a public mockery of Satan. Why? He could have just been transported to the third heavens at the right hand of the Father, right? But he ascended. Because he had to go through the second heavens, which is Satan's domain, the prince of the air, and he pulled a spiritual Schwarzenegger on him and said, I'll be back. <laughs> Satan hates the Jews because they gave the world three things. And most believers don't realize this. They gave us monotheism. When I say us, they gave it to me. 
monotheism. Prior to this, you know what you would be sitting with your kids? You'd be throwing them in the fire and cutting yourself to gods. I've seen it. I've seen them throw kids in the Ganges in India. I've seen it. You don't know what it's like to be in this country and serve the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Lest we forget. Rabbi, you seem a little emphatic about this. Oh, you have no idea how emphatic I am. I'm holding back so much because I'm so tired of the community of believers being detached from their Jewish roots of faith. I'm so tired of them putting a wall between the Old and the New Testament. I'm so tired of thinking that Jesus converted to Catholicism. Monotheism. And when they asked Jesus, what's the most important commandment? He said, monotheism. Shema Yisrael, Adonai El Hanel, Adonai Echad. The Lord is one. There's one God. It's a unified plurality or a plural unity, but there's one God, guys. One. Not three gods. One. One God. They gave us the Bible. Paul said in Romans 3, the oracles of God. You love your Bible? You should love a Jew. They preserved it. They died for it. You buy it at Walmart. They died for it. Before they knew Yeshua. And most importantly, John 4, 22, salvation is of the Jews. Esther 3, 7, in the first month, the month of Nisan, that's on God's biblical calendar. We're now in the 12th month, Adar, in the 12th year of Ashaviris. We know that's 474 B.C. Dates are important. That's why God put it there. They began throwing pure. Why? Because you can look at the history books in Persia and it will cross-reference. It will cross-reference the history books. They support our Bible. They corroborate our Bible. Throwing pure, that's lots. Before Haman every day and every month until the 12th month, which is the month of Adar. So look what we got here. First of all, in the days of antiquity, even up to Pentecost, the casting of the lot was a legitimate way of determining God's will. But by a seeming coincidence, the date was a year away. Why did God make the date a year away? God was allowing sufficient time to thwart Haman's plans. Proverbs 16, 33. One can cast lots into one's lap. Go ahead. But the decision comes from Adonai. You don't give him enough credit, guys. Roll the dice. Go ahead. But God will determine how they land. And you know why? Proverbs 21:30. No wisdom, discernment, or counsel succeeds against the Lord. Man is powerless to outwit God in wisdom and understanding or strategy. None of his plots can avail against the Lord. I have a question, class. Why won't man's plans avail against the Lord? Because man's plans... Bingo. That brings us to number three in our last point. Wickedness is absurd. Some of you have your eyes so much on wickedness. I don't watch the news. I could care less. I watch the signs of the times. I'm only watching for one thing, guys, and that's for the, for the eastern sky to be rent. Ever since I'm born again, that's what I watch for. I don't get distracted by this or that or the other. I'm, I'm preparing for the coming of the Lord and I'm trying to prepare everyone else for the coming of the Lord. And I'm trying to get anybody I can into the kingdom. By any method I know how. <laughs> Satan doesn't win. They had a fight a long time ago. He was the highest cherub. All the angels reported to him. And when he confronted the Lord... And he said, I will raise my kingdom. A trap door opened from the third heavens, and he was history. He might be a powerful angel, but he's no match for Almighty God. Amen. Let's look using the book of Esther. We're almost done. Esther 7, 9 through 10. Harvana, one of the king's attendants, said, look. The gallows, 75 feet high, that Haman made for Mordecai, who spoke only good for the king, is standing at Haman's house. The king said, hang him on it. So they hanged Haman on the gallows he prepared for Mordecai.
Then the king's anger subsided. I mean, if you can't see this in the future, once the enemy's bound for a thousand years, the king's anger will subside. And only then. I'll get into more of that next week. Haman took Mordecai's place on the gallows, God's boomerang. Esther 8, 1 through 2. That same day, King Ashaviris gave the house of Haman, the enemy of the Jews, to Esther the queen. The wealth of the wicked is stored up for the righteous. People think, you know, you get in those Pentecostal settings, ooh, I'm going to take a bunch of rich people's money. Not in this life, you're not. I'm sorry, out of context, er, survey says you're wrong. Talks about the end times. When the Jews who will be the tail will become the head. Also Mordecai appeared before the king for Esther had revealed his relation to her. She's his queen, man. She's his queen. Coming against the Jews in Israel is coming against God. There's no way around it. The Bible declares it. It's the Zechariah 2.8. God says that the apple, his pupil, they're his vision. Did you ever get poked in the eye really hard? How does it feel? Even if it's by accident. You get real mad, right? Even if you were your grandchild, you were stupid. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> when you come against the Jews, you're poking God in the eye. Make no mistake. I don't care how much you love Jesus, you're deceived. Because you're in love with Jesus, who's in love with the Jewish people, and who at the end is coming back to fight a battle called Armageddon, because all the nations will surround her, and he's going to defeat her, because that's his bride, and he's going to be like, take your filthy hands off my bride. <laughs> and that's Bible 101. You don't have to be a theologian to know that. It's pretty obvious. As Mordecai appeared before the king for Esther had revealed his relationship to her, the king removed his signet ring. Look. I'm not pro-Jewish because I was born Jewish. I could care less. I didn't get saved by the Jews. I didn't get saved by Moshe or Mordecai or the Maccabees. I got saved by Messiah. But because I'm saved and because I'm on the tree now when I was broken off, I know my history. I know my biblical history. I'm not going to get deceived, man. That's the first thing Yeshua said when they talked about the end times in, in Matthew 24. The first thing he says, you be careful, don't be deceived. Don't be deceived. It's coming, big time. It's coming. Stop talking about the vaccine, for God's sakes, already, and move on. <laughs> then Esther put Mordecai in charge of Haman's house. The property of condemned criminals was forfeited to the crown back in that day. Haman's house was given to Esther, and Haman's position was given to Mordecai. Boomerang. Esther 8, 15 through 17. Meanwhile, Mordecai left the king's presence arrayed in royal blue and white. He changed my mourning into dancing. He took off my sackcloth and clothed me with joy. Sounds familiar? Psalm 30-ish? Come on, if you were dead in your sins, then this is you, man. You might not realize it, but you were in dust and ashes, and now you sit in royal blue and white. Wearing a large gold crown and a robe of fine linen and purple. Look at the colors. Blue representing the Son of God coming from the skies. White representing purity. Purple representing kingship. And all the city of Shushan shouted for joy. Wow. Wow. From broken down to totally broken through. For the Jews always, they were going to be exterminated. Now they're parting. They were going to be taken out. They had no hope. They were done. And now they're in the midst of a massive party. Who could pull that off? Your God can. And He did. And it wasn't just 2,500 years ago. It was 67. It was 48. 74. And to this very day, it's not the iron dome that protects Israel. It's the iron God that protects Israel. Yeah. 
For the Jews had gladness and joy of feast and a holiday. Wow. Many from the peoples of the land became Jews. It's in your Bible. Just throwing that out there. Do it at what you want. You don't like that part? Blacking it out. Thomas Jefferson did a bunch. Because fear of the Jews had overcome them. God turned their mourning into dancing. Many Gentiles became proselytes to, Jewish, to the Jewish faith. I guess they found out the king loves the Jews. Boomerang. Last verse, that's the 10-3. For Mordecai the Jew was second only to King Ashaviris. He was a great man among the Jews, popular with all his many countrymen. He sought the good of his people and interceded for the welfare of their descendants. You hear that? You know what the practicality is for you? Mordecai was a true patriot. A patriot. He used his greatness to promote the prosperity of Israel. In this, he was a type of Yeshua. A type and shadow. Who upon his throne of glory, Yeshua himself, seeks not his own, but spends his power for his people. It would be a phenomenal thing if every believer in the kingdom of God was like a Mordecai to the kingdom, striving according to his ability for the kingdom's prosperity. The message of Purim should not be limited, guys. Don't limit it to Israel, nor the history of Israel. But God's covenantal relationship with Israel confirms to us one of the greatest promises the Bible has to offer, that no matter what the situation, no matter what the circumstance, God will never leave us nor forsake us. And because the Lord has never turned his back on Israel, then we as new covenant believers grafted in and part of the commonwealth of Israel can be totally confident and 100% secure that the God of Israel will not turn his back on us either. Interestingly enough, there are two books where the name of God is not mentioned. One is the Song of Solomon, and the other one is the book of Esther. He's not mentioned in the book of Esther in all ten chapters. Therefore, for yours truly, the story of Purim means a lot. It declares to me a phenomenal truth that although God may seem invisible at times, he's invincible all the time. Chag Sameach, let's stand together. <laughs> Sounded like somebody fell asleep, huh? Well, all I can say is thank God our God doesn't slumber or sleep. <laughs> Stay awake. This is not the time to be sleeping. It's not the time to be jerking around. It's not the time to be worried about your lawn or where your kids are going to go to school. Prepare for the coming of the King. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And may the Lord lift up his very countenance upon you and give you peace in the name of the Prince of all peace, Yeshua. Yo Adonai pono velecha, vehunecha. Yesa Adonai pono velecha, v'yasem lecha. Shalom. I love you guys. Shabbat shalom. Say hello to my friend from Persia.